regular meeting of the city council to order. Roll call, please. Mayor Murphy. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Turco. Here. Council Member Doby. Here. Council Member Gross. Here. Council Member Hasselbrink. Here. Uh, we will have Council Member Hasselbrink will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, if you can um, stand with me and looks like we have a flag on Wendy's screen. And if you could join me in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, 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 States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I heard this prayer the other day, so a great personal risk of sparing no expense, I found it, called Prayer for a Pandemic. May those who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are most vulnerable. May we have the luxury of, may we who have the luxury of working from home respect and support those who must choose between preserving their health and paying their rent. May we who have flexibility to care for our children when the schools close, remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trip, remember those who have no place to go. May we who are losing our investments, remember those who have no money to invest. May we who settle in for quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the most loving, embrace humanity to our neighbors. Be aware, be accepting, be supportive, and be kind. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to oral communications. Wendy? As listed on the agenda, members of the public were requested to um, submit their request to speak via email. We received one request to speak from Barb Ringhofer. One moment, Barb, while I unmute your microphone and then you'll have three minutes to address the council. Hey, Barb, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you have three minutes to address the council. Hey, hi, hi, I'm Barbara Hofer. I'm a resident of Rossmore Highland and I'd like to speak on the um, on 10A, the ordinance uh, for elimination of large family daycare home isolation. Um, uh, parking for a large family um, daycare can be a huge public inconvenience and a safety issue. Currently, a small family drop drop off has clients that park in front of others' houses or across the sidewalk. Um, there is no designated parking in the driveway or on the street. If a large family daycare is left unregulated for parking and drop off, the entire block can have up to nine to 12 additional cars dropping off and pick up and close to times when current residences are going to take their children to school or going to work. This can be a safety issue as clients will be parking up to several houses away and walking past driveways as current residents are pulling out of their driveways to work in school. Thus, without our local ordinance of parking and drop-off um, for large family daycare, there will be a pu public inconvenience and a safety issue. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to speak with us. Excuse me, Mayor. Um, when did somebody sent you an email requesting to speak tonight? Did you not receive that email? Um, the email from Ms. Uh, Ringhofer was the only email I received for request to speak. She's also the only um, resident we have on participating in the call right now. Okay, all right. I was told that he sent you an email. All right. And um, I just uh, triple checked the emails and that is Ms. That was the only speaker request we've received. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll go on to council announcements. Um, Shelly? Uh, no, good, just hanging out and taking a day at a time. Good for you. Tanya? I have my first 
uh, formalized vector Zoom meeting, I think Wednesday of this week. So I may have something to share the next time we come together. Thank you. Dean? Oh, one moment, he's muted. Okay. <clears throat> Nothing to share today. Thank you, Dean. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Nothing to report today. Hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, also, I have very little to report. A lot of mayor's meetings, about four a week phone calls, but would like to encourage people to shop locally and help our merchants out. City manager with us? Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, audio cut out there for a second. Uh, just along the line of what you just said with regard to small businesses or shopping local, uh, staff spent uh, much of the weekend, and I'll, I'll, I'll obviously give a lot of credit to Ron and Evelyn for pulling together essentially a business resource guide that will be able to, our businesses will be able to use in order to help them safely reopen once the restrictions have been lifted. This runs through a gamut of different information points of what exactly they need to be anticipating, what they need to be planning for, training for their employees, different places where they can locate that training, and then also different guidelines that have come from the CDC, as well as things that have been developed here locally with the Orange County Business Council. So I uh, just wanted to say that obviously we're continuing to do uh, a lot with regards to city operations, ensuring that uh, you know the, the lights stay on and that uh, when you pick up the phone and you call the police, uh, officers show up. Uh, but we also are trying to see what kind of resources we can put out there for our business community so that they can start the planning process for uh, when they're able to reopen. Thanks, sir. Thank you. On to the warrants. Any questions or may I have a motion? I'll move. I'll second. Okay, roll call please. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Turco. Aye. Council Member Doby. Aye. Council Member Gross. Aye. Council Member Hasselbrink. Aye. Consent calendar, all consent calendar items may be acted upon by one motion unless a council member requests separate action on a specific item. Anybody like to pull anything? Anybody like to make a motion? I'll move. I will second. Roll call vote for that, please. Mayor Murphy? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Council member Doby? Aye. Council member Gross? Aye. Council member Hasselbring? Aye. That passes. On to a public hearing. Ordinance number 2020-03, state mandated elimination of large family daycare home regulation. You wanna start, Chet? Sure, sir. I'm actually gonna hand over the line share of the presentation to Michael, um, just to say that this is a state mandate, not something that was thought up here locally. Um, uh, Michael, uh, I'll let you take it away. Fair enough. Th thank you both. Uh, before the City Council for your consideration this evening, is an ordinance amending the Los Alamitos Municipal Code uh, for consistency with the recently enacted SB 34. Uh, by way of history, the city, or the state rather, has traditionally different, actually I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Are you all hearing me well? Yes, we're fine. Sounds good, okay. So the state has historically made a distinction between large and small family daycare homes. And when we're talking about these family daycare homes, this is not to be confused with the commercial uh, academy or daycare center. This is more along the lines of a home where the primary provider lives within the residence and during typically working hours will provide and care for children within their home. Uh, the small family daycare units were defined to be, uh, you know, homes that would help children or work with children totaling up to eight in number, whereas the large family daycares centers would be those that take care of up to 14 children. And again, historically, state law had differentiated between the two. Um, as to the small family daycare, state law said 
This is a residential use permitted by right. Anyone in a residential district can open their home to provide these services without being subject to any type of local licensing or discretionary land use review or any other sort of additional regulations. By contrast, cities were allowed to enact regulations that dealt directly with the large family daycare centers. And this goes along the lines of uh, you know, one of the public comments we had this evening talking about parking standards or, or different requirements for queuing of vehicles, uh, things along those lines. Um, as it turns out with SB 34, the distinction between the large and the small centers has now been removed, which means the city is compelled to treat these large family daycare centers as a residential use that's permitted by right and not subject to any type of additional licensing or zoning controls and regulations. Uh, so the ordinance before you this evening goes to that end. It amends the municipal code so that it's consistent with the current state law on this issue. Um, so it's largely a cleanup effort just to make sure that we don't have provisions in our code any longer that directly conflict with the law as amended by SB 34. And with that, I'll, I'll open up to any questions if you have any. Thank you. Anybody? 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 Michael, I've got a question. So this means that a house can have 14 children in it and they don't even need to have a business license? That is correct. And, and Michael, just to confirm, a house includes a condo, correct? Yes, SB 234 included language clarifying that these uses can be established in essentially any residential dwelling. So that can be a single family home, that could be a town home. Uh, you know, as, as a little sneak peek <laughs> further into our agenda, that may even be an accessory dwelling unit. And as our only speakers uh, pointed out earlier, all parking requirements are also non-existent, correct? That is correct. So is it correct we cannot pass any, re we cannot regulate these at all? At, at that level, that is correct. Um, any attempt to regulate these uses through land use controls would only be permissible if we impose the exact same limitations for every other residential use in that particular zoning district. Um, our prior code had additional regulations relating to uh, playground equipment, I think there were requirements for parking or queuing of vehicles. All of that stuff is no longer enforceable and lawful based on SB 234. Do we know how, how, how many of these businesses we have in the city, whether they're small or large? I don't know, Chad, if, you, if you, we have any information on that. Just from a standpoint, Leslie, Michael, feel free to jump in or Tom, but with regards to the fact that they don't have to register now, we're going to be in a tough position to actually be able to keep track of them uh, going forward. It's largely becoming a uh, an unregulated space. Yeah, as far as the, the large ones were registering, I mean, have we had many of these registering before for, for residential uh, purposes? Tom, Leslie, do you want to? We've only had one before, and then we also uh, disallowed one that was uh, applied a couple of years ago. It's not a, not a giant amount that I applied for business license. Okay. If we have if 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 we have one of these homes and there's traffic going in and out and people are blocking other residents' driveways, I mean, maybe Chief, is, is there something that residents should be doing or? Uh, you know, should they be calling the PD just because their driveway is being blocked day in and day out, or, or uh, what, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think that if anybody's, uh, well, for one, it's against the law to completely block somebody's driveway. I'm not talking about maybe sticking in into the apron of a driveway that they can still pass, but if they're blocking it, the, um, it's actually against the law to do that and we can go out there and cite them for doing that. Um, certainly if it becomes an issue um, for us and we become aware of that issue, we could actually do some patrol checks 
as a preventative me uh, measure to be out there and just kind of looking to see if people are parking that way uh, or causing any kind of traffic uh, hazard. Um, and then uh, cite them if it's if it's a citable offense or or warn them, you know, or try to get compliance by telling them to, you know, park their cars and not, uh, but any, but they're public streets so they can pub, park unless it's permit parking, you know, only they can pretty much park anywhere they want, you know, on a public street. Yeah. I, I had one resident tell me that they're having these issues with just a small daycare um, and, and they're worried about what's going to happen if the daycare expands to a larger daycare. So maybe I'll, I'll give you the address, uh, Chief. And, and uh, this resident has told me that their, their driveway is blocked every morning when the daycare is in operation and they can't get out to get to work, to get to, to drop their kids off at school. So it's a concern. Yeah, we'll look into it if you give us the address. Okay. Hey, Michael, they still need to be licensed through the state as a daycare, correct? That, that is accurate. The state will still have oversight and licensing authority for the for these centers. So if, we, so if we have a daycare that's unlicensed through the state, we can certainly have them patrol it. I mean, my, my concern is if you've got a daycare of 14 children, that's probably going to be three to four employees based on the age of the children of the daycare that are going to be parking there all day long in these residents Monday through Friday from seven in the morning to six at night. And if we don't comply with this ordinance, as usual, we'll get sued. Um, so we really don't have any say in this, but kind of makes sense to have a parking permit program now. I think it's something to be looked at, especially as the schools and districts get ready to roll out what school's gonna look like next year, mm -hmm. because daycare might be open business. Yeah. So I might know if they're going to be rolling out any additional information or if it's just kind of, this is the new loophole to jump in, but I could totally see it being a problem because I just got off a PTA call where they were trying to figure out how we're even going to do school and what child care will look like. And if I could open up my home with 14 children, that's quite an income. So I just want to make sure that they're going through the rigorous state process to get licensed and trained and, and everything else. Since we can't regulate it, let's turn the state on this. This isn't much different than the uh, sober living homes in the same thing. The state controls all of that as well. It's just that they don't have the cars. Well, and, and with the sober living homes, they can't have more than six beds. And if you, if you live near a school like I do, it doesn't make any difference. Morning, afternoon, uh, they'll block your driveway. And if the police are called, uh, they just ask them to move along. So there's there's no penalty. It's if they get out of the car and leave the car blocking the driveway. Um, there's there's really no penalty involved in doing that. Michael, I, I believe when you were speaking the first time, you said something about all houses must have the same regulations. Is, yeah, is I, I, what I meant by that is that the only way you can impose any type of additional parking restrictions or development standards would be if those new standards uniformly applied to every other residential use in that zoning district. So, so for example, we would not be able to enact an ordinance saying a single family residence used for a large family daycare center must have you know, a, a driveway ribbon capable of queuing up to six cars at a time off the right of way, unless you had that exact same requirement for every single family residence in that zoning district. What would be the problem with that since there probably wouldn't be anybody else using that? Uh, I, if I'm not being clear what I'm trying to communicate is that whether or not you were operating a large family daycare center, you would still have to have the same queuing capability at your single family residence. So I think, Tanya, an example would be, so we, we say that, you know, you have to have a queue up of six cars in your driveway. That would mean that my house, because I'm in R1, would have to have six cars queued up in the driveway 
whether or not I'm offering a daycare, all homes have to be treated equally. <laughs> okay. That, is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So, so Michael, does this state law require us to find that the ordinance would not be detrimental to the public convenience, health, interest, safety, or welfare of the city? That's a, that's a finding we have to make? Though those findings are required by our muni code for any time the council acts to amend the muni code. So okay. what we've attempted to do is draft it in a way that council can stomach notwithstanding possible concerns you may have about the fact that this law in essence takes away a lot of your abilities to ensure public health and safety. Yeah, so, I mean, some, when this sort of stuff happens and the ADU as well and sober living and all that, sometimes I wonder why we have a city council and why we have a local government because uh, the state of California is just telling us what to do and we can't do anything about it regardless of what it does to our city, of, of the characteristics of our city, of you know how different our city is from so many of the other cities that the legislators have in mind when they're passing these. They're thinking of San Francisco, of LA, of, of different places um, when they're passing all these ordinances. They're not thinking of little cities like ours, little suburban uh, cities. So it's really frustrating. Anyone else? Um, so we're gonna have to make a motion to pass this, correct? Yes. And it's a public hearing. Oh when goodness, did you is there a timeline on this? Is there a time that we have to pass it by? This this law became effective in January, so it's already in place. So in essence, this is a cleanup item just to, to clear our code of language that conflicts with that law. Uh, but the law is in effect. If somebody wants to open a large family daycare center in Los Alamitos tomorrow, they can do that without any sort of permit approvals from the city. Whether or not we pass this tonight. Correct. We're not really giving anybody any permission to do anything here that they can't already do. Is that correct? That is correct. I still don't want to vote for it. Right. That's why nobody's saying <laughs> <laughs> We're all playing chicken. Michael, does this expose, if we don't do anything with this, and we don't clean this up, does this expose us to anything? Uh, I think that ex that exposure would most likely occur if we tried to enforce the existing code provisions to prevent someone from establishing. So I would rather just not do anything and we're not gonna do, be able to do anything if it happens anyway, so why, I don't know, more of a principle of a thing, why, why do anything with it if it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. Why put it in our code? I mean, I, I think there's perhaps this is getting more into a closed session type conversation, but the, there is a potential that someone would be discouraged from attempting to open one of these facilities based on the reading of our code, thinking that we do prohibit these uses and then therefore asserting some sort of state claim against the city. So I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we table this until we can go into closed session to understand the legal ramifications of having an ordinance on our books like this. I'll second that. Uh, be, before we take a vote on that motion, Councilmember Gross did did raise a good point that this is a public hearing item. So I'd ask that we we open it to the public to see if there are any members who wish to comment. Um, Does our speaker from earlier wish to speak? Um, no, I currently live next to the small family um, daycare that exists in Rossmore Highland. So I lived through this and and was one of those that helped defeat the large family daycare several years ago. 
So I have been through this scenario, and it is not fair to the neighborhood for a large family daycare, considering all the cars that are parked and all the logistics that go behind it. So I'll stay with my prior statement, too. Thank you. Wendy, anybody else who might want to speak on this? Uh, we did not receive any other requests to speak. And there's okay. no one on the line participating. Um, so Shelly has made a motion to hold this up until we can go in a closed session. There was three seconds. Um, we have a roll call vote on that, please. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Murphy? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Cherko? Yes. Council Member Doby? Yes. Council Member Gross? Yes. Council Member Hasselbring? Yes. Okay. Go on to 10B. I can safely say if you like 10A, you're going to love 10B. <laughs> uh, 10B, Ordinance Number 2020 04, State Mandated Updates, Accessory Dwelling Unit, Regulation ZOA 1902. Michael, you stuck with this one too? Yep, I'm, I'm happy to go with it unless you want to kick it off with some comments, Chet. Uh, just to say again that this is a mandate from the state. Um, unlike the previous item, which largely had settled all of the questions that were in place, there are elements of this that while you don't have a lot of latitude, you have some latitude with regards to the regulations that you can put in place largely around um, restricting the overall size uh, within reason. And so, um, whereas the last item did obviously is questionable as to whether or not there, there's value to adopting it, this one would allow you to be a bit more prescriptive than what the state has allowed for. So with that, I'll kick it to Michael. Thank you, Chet. So uh, the proposed ordinance before you this evening is another Los Alamitos Municipal Code zoning code amendment it is intended to update our code to reflect the most recent state law enactments concerning the regulation of accessory dwelling units. Accessory dwelling units, um, I know you've all seen seen these issues come before you previously, but uh, they're essentially an independent small residential use that is located on the same lot as another primary residence. Um, they're independent in the sense that they have their own cooking facilities, restroom, shower facilities, et cetera, and exterior access points. Uh, the state has for several years promoted these accessory dwelling units as a, as a means of increasing the supply of housing and potentially affordable housing throughout the state. Uh, prior to the most recent enactments, there were changes in 2016 that limited the local jurisdiction's abilities to review these uses, to impose parking requirements, and to undertake any sort of discretionary review of these units. Um, the legislature has continued down that track with these most recent enactments, which further restrict the ability of local governments to impose any sort of discretionary review or local regulation and control of these units um, in large part. Some of the more notable changes that were listed in the staff report uh, that were enacted in 2019 is that cities are no longer able to require the owner of a primary residence to reside on the same property where an ADU is developed. Uh, this in essence means that someone could develop a single family property, build an ADU, and the owner no longer is required to reside there. They could simply use it as an income generating property and rent out both the primary and the separate ADU unit. Um, other notable changes of the recent legislation are the bill now clarified that these units can be built not only in connection with the single family residence, but also with multi family dwellings, such as townhomes and condos. And the legislation has also streamlined the time within which the city is required to act on an application for an ADU. Um, the city now has 60 days within submittal of a complete application to review a submittal and act on it. And the city's consideration in this case is limited to ministerial permitting, meaning the city in essence has to follow a checklist to make sure the proposed unit 
comports with objective standards. There's no longer an, any element of discretionary review that the city can undertake to, to try to compel a, an applicant to undertake some sort of design or aesthetic changes. In essence, the city has to say, okay, is this unit the right size um, in terms of building permit requirements? And if so, uh, the unit must be allowed. One area of discretion that Chet did mention that the city has some latitude is the ability to impose a maximum unit size cap. Uh, when this measure first went to the Planning Commission for review, we had included a 1,200 square feet maximum unit size cap for two bedroom ADUs. And that was consistent with what our Muni code had in place prior to the most recent state action. When the Planning Commission undertook review and through our conversation, they decided and recommended that instead the city impose the most restrictive standard on size that it could, which is uh, 1,000 square feet for a two bedroom unit. And so based on the Planning Commission's direction, we have in fact modified the ordinance to reflect that maximum unit size. Another component um, that was added following Planning Commission re review was we have added language saying that an ADU must be architecturally consistent with the primary unit, meaning when an applicant comes in, they should be expected to make an effort to have these units somehow be consistent with and coherent in the context of the existing dwelling unit. Um, aside from that, I guess, as I stated before, parking requirements have great, been greatly diminished through this recent state action. Previously, if a developer were seeking to develop an existing garage and convert it to an ADU, the city would permit that and allow it, but they would be required to replace the on-site parking that had been provided for the single family residents somewhere else on the property. As revised now, the law says that if you convert an existing accessory structure and through that conversion, you eliminate or reduce on-site required parking for a primary residence, there's no requirement that that parking be replaced on site. So it's, it's an additional step of greatly relaxing any sort of parking standards or requirements, not only for these ADU uses, but also for the primary units that they impact when they go in. Um, I could probably continue all day on this in terms of, of measures that I think perhaps are overreaching or bind the city's hands in large respect. Uh, but I think perhaps at this point, it may be most useful just to open it up to a conversation on the issue. Again, we are a public hearing. Do we have anybody, anybody from the public, Wendy? No, we did not receive any requests to speak for this item. Okay, thank you. Back to my colleagues. Who'd like to start? I have a couple questions. Why not? Um, you know, once again, state mandated, we can't do anything. We're going to be the most restrictive we can. A couple things we might want to look at for future. One is, you know, not that we're a destination city by any means, but because the owners don't need to be living in these ADUs anymore or be part of the property at all, it might be a good idea to stick an ordinance on the books about short term rentals. Um, I know a lot of beach communities do, but make sure that it's not people coming in and out all the time, but at least if they're gonna be living there, they've got some sort of tie to the community for a certain amount of time. I don't know how long we can limit short-term rentals. Was it 10 days, 30 days, 60 days? That I don't know. Um, and the other point is, and it's probably gonna affect my neighborhood because I'm seeing these go up already. I've got one building on the corner of me and it's, turning into a massive structure. It's a house rebuild plus a couple of ADUs in Carrier Road because our lots are so big, these are going up much more frequently. And just, you know, I know that it got shot down this last time, but as these start going up to revisit the parking permit program again, if this becomes a big issue. Mayor, if I, if I may provide a quick response to that. Um, I, I neglected to mention it before, but one of the things we are authorized to do is restrict these units with respect to short-term rentals. And so the ordinance before you does state that these units may not be rented for periods of less than 30 days, which 
the state law allows us to do, um, but is an option that the city may exercise. And so what I mean by that is, that's an example of where our enactment locally actually does provide some additional protection that would not otherwise exist if we don't take action on this ordinance. Is the law going to do 30 days? Yes. Okay. That's something. I feel like I have a little bit of power. And is there is there any provision regarding parking that can be enforced here? Gen the, the general rule with ADUs now is that an ADU must provide one parking spot when it's constructed. Uh, but I would say that the general rule is riddled with exceptions. If that unit is close to a transit stop or a bus stop, there's no parking requirement. If that unit was created from an existing or within an existing home or an accessory structure, then likewise, there's no parking requirements. So there are some requirements in instant or in limited situations where you can ask for additional on-site parking to be provided. But again, the, the exceptions defeat the rule in large part. Okay, with a, so in, in our city with a, with a bus that goes down Catala and a bus that goes down the boulevard, anything laying on, a half mile on either side of that, we're precluded from doing anything. Correct? Yes. Okay, so we're we're basically we're we're not going to be able to use parking to help us here. Yeah, it's if the ADU is located in one half mile walking distance of public transit, including transit stations and bus stations. So. I think you would be looking for an actual bus shell as opposed to just a line running through there, but okay. nevertheless. Okay. So there is one glimmer here, and that would be for our residents. If none of them are happy with what's being shoved down our, our uh, way on these two items alone, elections have consequences and we've got an election coming up in november so it behoves them as voters to thoroughly vet any candidates that are running for state office because it's those candidates that are doing this to us thank you dean any anyone else and i just want to say if you th this to me this disgusts me this law that if you if you look at the amount of time the city through the planning commission and then through the city council through the general plan that we put into the discussing this subject and now it's all just whitewashed away with one stroke of the pen from sacramento uh if you've saved all your life to get a single family resident which really is a gold standard in this country and here it here it is here it is taken away there's no there's no loosening of the regulations to build houses in general which is really the thing that would improve housing but instead we get we get something like this in the long run this this has a potential to turn every house into a triplex and every four unit building can now become seven. As, as all of you know, as you go through Carrier Row, 80 to 90 percent of the people who have a garage use it for storage. They either park behind the garage door or, or on the street. So can you imagine if there's some more conversions of those garages and then we add three units to a fourplex already out there? We're probably three units is adding, let's say, six to eight cars. Per, per fourplex, and there are hundreds of them over there. What's this going to look like in two years? Richard, you can go next door to me where we have a grandfathered in with a house and two apartments that was done years and years and years ago, and there's three units there, and there are 12 cars. Yeah. I mean, I, I live right next door to it, and across the street and two houses down, 
they're building the same thing as ADUs and it's going to be the same exact thing and they're on a corner so now they're affecting two streets so the only recourse you have is this becomes a problem to go back and visit the permit program where it's becoming a problem because we can localize that but other than that there's nothing real we can do about it uh, Mr. Mayor if I can make a quick comment Please. so obviously the a lot of every jurisdiction is dealing with this issue and especially the fallout from parking and then also just the idea that neighborhoods are changing one of the things that we've done in the past and we're starting to do now here is to actually look at different programs that we can put in place that are not directly related to adus but simply more neighborhood preservation type um, programs such as um, registering rental properties, ensuring that code enforcement is up to speed on them, where they're located, those kind of things in order to make sure that we're keeping an eye on properties when they transition one way or the other. And at least to provide a, a monicum of that these properties continue to be, or the owners continue to be good actors, given the fact that the owner no longer has to live there. Um, it's a difficult issue, but I do believe that there are additional things that we can do that probably a step further than we want to go, but what might give us some tools in hoping to kind of curtail um, these properties and their owners from becoming bad actors in the neighborhood. Is it, do these units, because they can be up to a two bedroom unit, do they qualify as part of our rent account? In other words, do we get some benefit that way as well. I don't know if Leslie, if you'd prefer to jump in on that, but but I do believe that there is a benefit in terms of the arena allocation and counts based on ADUs going in. I would just say, and Leslie, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's a percentage, Dean or uh, Councilman. It's uh, not going to get us all the way there. Um, and again, it's going to be based on how many of these things are ultimately built. But uh, at, at the end of the day, it's not going to solve our, our arena calculation issues. No, I understand that, but it just, it, it helps. If there's any, any lining in all of this, it helps to add additional housing units. True. Uh, into that. <clears throat> the, the codes that are being changed to allow multi-use and up to 10 stories Will that affect any of this, or is that only on commercial residential type zoning? I, I think that may be a, a question for community development. Are we talking about um, updates for multi-use tenancies and mixed-use areas of yes. the city? Um, Councilmember Gross, if you could repeat the question. I wasn't quite sure what you were asking. A question was, because the state is coming down, relaxing height limits and allowing, uh, especially on multi-use property, upwards of 10 stories. Will this apply the same way? In other words, is there, I know I've read the ordinance and there is a restriction I believe on uh, 16 feet, but as we progress down this road, is there a chance that these are going to become even taller? So, if it can, uh, Councilman, I no, I think the restriction with regards to uh, building that height um, in those locations is going to be the standard. I don't think that that is going to be relaxed. Um, there is some question as to what exactly this means going down the road with regards to high rises and all those kind of things. And I think that the effects of that have yet to be seen. But... Okay. Thank you. So Chet, on the last issue, we kind of punted by uh, bringing it back. Is there anything that's worth discussing in closed session here? So I would say to the council that the while the other issue, there's some question, I think, from a, a to council member Hasselbrink's point of a, you know, uh, what a principled stand might be. 
in this <laughs> instance, this is this is law, and also from the standpoint of until we have a an all, are we adopt our ordinance, people can come in and start building the larger units that are currently allowed under the state law. So, by adopting this ordinance, you actually are again putting more controls in place. It allows us to stem the tide a little bit with regards to buildings that are being built that don't have the same architectural difference or the, are not the same architecturally as the rest of the community. So I would I would suggest passing this ordinance tonight. And then if there are other items that you would like to discuss with regards to it, um, we're happy to agendize it for closed session if we find a way to go further. But uh, Michael and I have spent a significant amount of time talking about this item. Um, both with the planning commission and with each other. And I think that we've reached the point of what is gonna be allowable. Um, because at the end of the day, this ordinance again has to go back up to the state and be approved there. Um, so I don't think that there's going to be a lot of ground for us to be able to add additional regulations into this space. Uh, Michael, I, I don't know if you wanna follow up on that as well. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think we've done the best we can with severe limitations to try to carve out whatever controls or requirements that we can that could potentially help the city or help the impact of these developments in the city. And until we have an ordinance in place, uh, the default will simply be state law, which is more permissive than what we've presented to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, with that, I'd like to make a motion to pass this as is. All second. second. Okay, Dean will second. Roll call vote. Mayor, would you like me to read the title in for the record before the vote's taken? Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before the council for consideration is ordinance number 2020 04 entitled. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Los Alamitos, California, amending and restating section 17.08.020 and 17.28.020 of the Los Alamitos Municipal Code concerning the regulation of accessory dwelling units. Thank you. Wendy, you're up, I guess. We have a motion by Councilmember Hasselbring, seconded by Councilmember Gross for staff recommendation. Roll call, Mayor Murphy. A very reluctant yes. Mayor Pro Tem Charco. Yes. Councilmember Doby. Yes. Councilmember Gross. Yes. Councilmember Hasselbring. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, before we go on, I'd like to thank the uh, Planning Commission for all the work they did on this issue, and especially uh, Commissioner Victor Sofalkanik for all his follow-up. Moving on, 10C, Master Fee Schedule Update. Chet? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as you are aware, um, cost recovery is a large issue for uh, any jurisdiction, but especially in a small jurisdiction. Uh, whenever you have these services which are um, voluntary or are requested, um, there's a nexus that allows us to ensure that we're capturing our full cost recovery. Um, the simple case, and I'll get, put it over to Craig um, to answer any questions, essentially is that every time where we do not have true cost recovery, residents are supplementing the cost of a service to a developer or to an individual who chooses to take advantage of that service. As such, it's important to maintain that you are, um, that you're keeping that balance so that the cost is not being not choosing to use the service. Uh, with that, I'll uh, kick it to Craig for a uh, presentation or any questions. Okay, thank you, so uh, Chet. Uh, for the record, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, for the record, Craig Kohler, Interim Finance Director. Uh, just a bit of way, a little bit of background information. In 2015, the city engaged a consulting firm, NBS, to conduct an independent user fee charges study. In 2017, the, the study was completed. And on uh, July 31st, 2017, the council adopted resolution 2017-13 
which approved the master fee schedule pursuant to the recommendations of NBS. With that recommendation, they also recommended that the user fees uh, keep pace with the cost of inflation by way of utilizing a cost um, a CPI adjustment. So at this time, city staff has conducted an annual review of the master fee schedule and recommended, recommends an increase of 1.9% to the applicable fees and charges to reflect the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index for the Los Angeles area, inclusive of Orange County, for the period of March 2019 through March 2020. The uh, estimated increase in revenue resulting from this CPI adjustment is approximately $15,000. Uh, to note here that the proposed budget for fiscal year uh, 2020 to 21 does not include or assume any CPI adjustment to the city's uh, fee schedules uh, at this point. Yeah, we'll open up to any questions that the uh, council has. Any comments? I have one. For the record, this is a public hearing and we did not receive any um, resident comments, requests for speech. Thank you. Does someone have something to say? Yeah, I do. I don't see where it's a public hearing. Uh, it's a discussion item, I think. No, it's a public hearing. It's listed as uh, 10C under public hearings. Okay. All right. My question is on the very last, almost the last page of the fees. I've gone through each of the pages, most of it seems to be recovery cost uh, on parks and recreation um, the five five series aquatics we're not doing anything on and there's no changes apparently under community services uh, we're recommending this is for seniors program facility rental of the community center the gym or the shelters and public works building maintenance we're requesting only a 30 percent fee which means we're giving away 70 percent and i don't think that's appropriate um day camp is at 85 percent we're we're subsidizing 15 percent on sports you're showing 64 percent that's the 36 percent giveaway on special classes um and I believe this is the majority of the classes we have, you're showing a recovery of 35%, but a giveaway of 65%. Uh, preschool is at 86. Uh, special events are at 65%. What is the reasoning behind the, the low recovery on, those, on a lot of these classes or these programs? Why aren't they 100%? And uh, allow me, I'll, I'll kick it to both Ron and Emily to, uh, to fill in the gaps. But I, I'll, just from a historical standpoint, um, in general, uh, recreation department programs that are kind of fall into a category of maybe social services or services that are provided directly to residents, I have seen that historically there are, this area is typically not a 100% cost recovery. Um, but again, I'll kick it to Ron and Emily to uh, maybe they can provide some background. Well, let me start first and then um, Emily will follow. But uh, depending on the program that you are mentioning, Councilman uh, Gross, uh, like Chet said, some of it is a community service type thing where we do not recover costs such as senior services, our senior service program, and our like so another example is our summer park program. Other programs, um, such as our adult sports, our day camp, we try to be competitive with the going market rate so we can um, still allow people to come in and get quality programming. But if we charge too high, such as recovering at 100% cost, then we are gonna price ourselves out of that market, right? And then um, a, a third example that I know, uh, that I heard from you is contract classes uh, or special classes. That is because the instructor does the majority of the work that's why we pay out that out 65 percent so the 35 percent that we take in is pretty much like a rental fee for them to utilize our building um and then they do all the marketing 
they 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 teach the class they come up with a lesson plan and all that so um that's just a really quick overview and i i know emily can dive a little bit deeper into that um good evening yes we try to cover when we um are referring to direct costs in terms of supplies and staffing for programs however when you take into account overhead costs such as um, you know, administration, um, keeping the building, keeping the lights um, on, that type of thing, that's when you see that the cost recovery is not present because it in incorporates the overhead costs. But we do try to um, re retain all of the, or recover all of the direct costs. Okay. You know, for my fellow colleagues, I've been to some of the all of these programs are definitely worthwhile. I'm definitely in favor of us doing them, providing them for the community. But on the senior programs, as an example, uh, I've been to a few of their uh, events and functions, and there's a large number of people that aren't Los Alamitos. They're coming from Long Beach. They're coming from other cities because they like the program we do. I'm just concerned with the financial situation that we're going into, irrespective of the COVID-19 issues. I'm worried that policy-wise, we're allowing the taxpayer to subsidize a lot of these type programs. And I'm not sure if that's really the case. As an example, five, six years ago, maybe even a little bit longer than ago, we didn't have the Los Alamitos Education Foundation offering the same kinds of classes through the school district. Those, uh, for lack of anything, are being paid for uh, by the taxpayers who donate support late. We've got a youth center that does a summer camp, does the same kind of thing. I don't know that they're subsidizing in the same way. What Ron is saying, I believe, is that they, to compete with them, we have to get down into the same area. I'm not really sure whether we need to be in that area if there's two other entities within the community that are providing the services. Um, I recognize it's, it's cost effective, but the day camp is done, I believe, over in Rossmore. Um, and the youth center's day camps are done in Rossmore as well. Um, I think we need to take a harder look, or the council needs to take a, a harder look at our cost recovery when we're looking in, and I understand it's building cost, it's lights, the youth center uses that building um, and I don't know if they're paying their fair share from the standpoint of, of overhead and costs. We're spending uh, a lot of money with repairs to restrooms, repairs to flooring, repairs to roll up doors, repairs to the roof uh, that are that are not really, I don't think reflected in these in these costs. Um, I just wonder why we're on community services, we're eating 70%, on classes, we're eating 65%. Um, it would seem for a start, we ought to be at least at a 50 50 uh, role on some of those. We're, you know, the, the day camp, um, it, it's an 85%, and we're only eating 15% that makes sense the preschool uh, a 14 percent uh, increase or i mean a 14 percent loss um and the special events if we're going to do them we ought to be doing them as close to cost neutral as we possibly can i don't think we can continue to go down the road policy wise offering these kinds of programs if the community wants them then I think the community needs to understand they have to pay the, pay the right fare going in, 
we can't, I don't think, continue to afford to, to write off 70%, 65%, so on. I don't know how my other colleagues feel. I feel that there's a lot of competition out there, and I feel that the youth center that offers their day camp in Rush Park, nobody from the Highlands would go. They're, they're going to go for the cheapest alternative for day camp. And Rush Park is not an inconvenience for anybody in Los Alamitos to go to to spend summer camp. Um, I think we don't have the loyalty. Nobody does when you're offering like programs. And I think if we raise our prices too high, we're going to lose the customer base and we'll never get it back. And I think we, we need those programs. And as long as we're not losing money on them, I think it's something we need to offer because the competition is intense out there between private industry, offering classes, LAIF, the youth center, um, everything else. And I think we just, we need to be as competitive and creative as possible. Mark or Tanya? I, I would say that I agree with Dean, uh, but it's it's to me it's more of a. I think the fees right now are fair, and and the the system we have of using inflation to try to keep up so we don't get into the same spot we got in three years ago, where we hadn't looked at it in a number of years. This at least will be a mechanism to keep it going, but when we are doing our budget, I think we we do need to take a look at this area. Mayor, and I also think as we move forward, as we start reopening things, things are going to look different. And I think that's going, to, that's going to guide us in what classes we offer, how we offer them, how many people can be there. And I think that's going to set more policy than just us raising prices right now for the set of raising prices. So I'd rather just wait to see how we look when we reopen to revisit this. Okay. Would you care to move the fee schedule? Sure. I'll, I'll move that. Uh, I will second it. And we'll have a roll call vote. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Turco. Aye. Council Member Doby. Aye. Council Member Gross. On the basis of my discussion, I'm going to vote no. Council Member Hasselbrink. Aye. So it passes four to one. Move on to discussion item annual 4th of July spectacular. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before uh, I kick it over to uh, Ron to go through the details, I, I just wanted to say that when I first joined the city, I had the opportunity to go out to the race on the base. It was my first full-fledged uh, Los Alamos event. Um, Michael ran faster than me in the uh, 5K, which was embarrassing for me, but <laughs> it was a great showing of what this community is about in terms of the events and then also just the events that your recreation department puts on. Um, the item before you is largely to talk about one of those events given the current pandemic and where exactly we're at. Um, this is one that I've struggled with personally. Um, there is part of me that wants to see this event go forward and obviously in a reduced capacity, but uh, I understand the challenges of it. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to Ron. Thank you. Good evening again, Mayor, City Council. But a uh, little background on the 4th of July. So I think a lot of you are aware that our annual 4th of July draws approximately anywhere between twelve to 15,000 to the uh, Joint Forces Training Base. And uh, we have a pretty massive footprint over there where we utilize the big um, tarmac for parking and what we call the East Ramp, which is a very large square footage for our event area. Our event incorporates, uh, we bring in a large stage with the accompanying sound. We have live entertainment. Uh, we have food trucks. We have uh, static displays. We have vendors. We have games or um, activities for, um, I wouldn't call it games, but activities for children and families to do. And people come out, uh, gates open at four o'clock and they just hang out for the day to celebrate the 4th of July. Like I said, listen to music. And then at 9 p.m., one of the longest and greatest, uh, best, I won't say greatest, but best fireworks show is shot off, shut up, shot in the into the sky. So what the reason why I say our fireworks show is very good is the fact that it's 22 minutes long and that we fire um, ground fireworks, but we fire shells up to 10 inches high. 
uh, 10 inch shells. So that's about a thousand feet in the air. And because of the massive air base airfield, we can shoot those. Most cities only are shooting four to five inch shells into the sky. And we double that. And because of that, again, that's my opinion. I think we do a very awesome fireworks show with accompanying music. Again, with COVID-19 and this pandemic, it has changed the landscape of um, all our events. Quite frankly, we had to cancel a lot of our um, recreation events starting in the spring in March. Uh, and so now we're going forward for the 4th of July and we can, um, again, it's a discussion with the city council, but uh, one scenario that we're gonna put there is that uh, we just shoot the fireworks show. I've talked to the base last week and had a discussion with them saying that it's only gonna be firework personnel and a couple city staff, and then we're gonna go up there and we're gonna fire the firework show. We're gonna eliminate the ground fireworks uh, and then we're just gonna um, and replace them with four to five inch shells so, so we can get them higher. So homes that surround the community can view it at the safety of their own residents. Along that route, if we do decide that we're gonna go into a massive, um, you know, advertising or marketing to talk about the requirements uh, the, uh, specifically for this COVID-19, about the gatherings and the social distancing and all that. So again, uh, that is a recommendation, one of the recommendation that we can do as again, uh, I know that there's gonna be some, you know, challenges again with uh, people. Uh, one of the things that I do wanna mention, it's in the report that most of the city have canceled their shows. Uh, the only city that I am aware of that is going to proceed with their show today, they could change their mind is San Juan Capistrano, but most of the cities um, have canceled their shows or um, it's on the agenda for um, discussion. Um, but again, talking to the base, they were, are currently allowing us to go on and shoot fireworks and people around the city um, can view it from the safety of their home. The second option, of course, is just to uh, direct staff to uh, not pursue an agreement with the firework company and just cancel the event altogether. Uh, but again, um, one of the things that is uh, we got to talk about, and I've inquired that with the base, is the fiscal impact of it. So the, uh, the proceeds that we incur from race on the base has to be utilized for the 4th of July. If not, then we have to pass that entire proceeds onto the um, California Department, uh, California Military Department, State of California. And I've inquired to them that because of COVID-19, can we delay the proceeds of the 2020 race to the 2021 uh, 4th of July, if that occurs? They have not responded. They are running that up through their legal um, up to Sacramento. And then they say they'll let me know as soon as possible. But uh, again, um, that's kind of a little bump in the road for that. But uh, right now the fireworks show is approximately $32,000 and the Royce proceeds around 14. Republic Services sponsorship is 15,000. And then the rest of the gap we're gonna fill in with most likely other sponsorships such as Memorial Care of Long Beach. Uh, but uh, that ends my report and I will be happy to take any questions or if anyone else like uh, Emily or Chet wants to add. I just add one additional thought. So uh, I, as recently as last week, have was having conversations with the city manager in Seal Beach. They have budgeted money to contribute to this uh, event as well. And I received a commitment from uh, their city manager that in the event that we were to move forward, that they would be um, willing to contribute financially to the uh, to the cost of the event as well. So what? So what would the cost be? I'm, I'm, I know it's thirty-two thousand for the fireworks, but we're talking about Republic is contributing fifteen, Seal Beach may contribute, and we've got proceeds from Race on the Base. What, what are we going to be out of pocket if we go forward? You will not be out of pocket for materials and all those things. Uh, the only cost is obviously the the cost of staff, which is already figured into the overall budget. But that's if you have the fireworks show from afar, right? That's assuming that no one goes on the base to see fireworks? That is correct. Right now, um, even though the base did not say that we weren't allowed to have participants come onto the base to view it, uh, my discussion with them is tentatively they don't want people to come onto the base. So they, they said that the, the scenario that we presented in the staff report where it's only the firework contractor and maybe a few staff members for cleanup, 
because uh, you know we have to clean up the shells they'll allow that but uh um i don't think they're gonna allow us to have an actual public come onto the base with all this uh uh, COVID-19 stuff that we're dealing with. Even if they don't leave their car, like if they pull in drive-in style, they still won't allow it? That is correct. That is actually the first scenario that we presented to them was a drive-up style, and they, they kind of had some trepidations about that. We would also recommend to close um, some of the parks, Little Cottonwood Park or Lewis, where a lot of the mass gatherings would typically occur to watch the fireworks and also if Seal Beach, um, we would talk to them about Arbor Park as well. Even, and that's that's the case. I mean, even even if people social distance, we would still close the parks just because we're assuming it wouldn't be sufficient social distancing or too big of a crowd or why, yeah, why is that? You couldn't really regulate um, that. We usually also have a restroom there um, for parks program, and we we are not going to have that this year. Yeah. Where do you see the fireworks? Make friends with somebody who does. <laughs> hey, Shelly, will you be my friend? You can be my friend. I mean, honestly, guys, you know, Seal Beach is willing to work with us. There's no out of pocket. You know, this is this would be a huge shot in the arm for our local residents to say something's going to be normal. It might not be the same, but my goodness, at least we get to do something. Because I think if we don't do it, we're going to have to leave fire all up and down our streets in our city because they're going to celebrate regardless. And I just think psychologically, it's not going to cost us anything. It's a good partnership with Seal Beach, which we could use. And why not? Um, so some of our residents can see it. You know, we're in the process of kind of reopening by Fourth of July. It's probably going to be a little bit more open, and I just think this is a nice summer tradition. I just think psychologically, we need. But they be televised too. We, I mean, we could do it on Facebook Live. We could definitely do that. I mean, because my thought is, what if there's restaurants that are open by then, and they can stream it like they do fights? and they stream a fireworks show and then it gets them a little business if we have evolved to that place. And then people that might not be able to see it as well can head over to a local place and, and check out the show. Great suggestion. Yeah, we'll look into that, yes. I was, uh, I was ready to be the Grinch. I wrote down, you know, 22 minutes for $32,000. Uh, assuming we would be paying a big chunk of that, but but if we're not, I think that's I agree with uh, Shelley. If Seal Beach is willing to contribute, if uh, Republic is pay paying a big chunk, and if we've got proceeds from Race on the Base that we might not otherwise be able to use, um, I think we I, I'd be in favor of moving forward. Um, I, I'd want the residents to know. I don't know if we put it in the paper or or maybe some posts on social media. I would definitely want the residents to know that um, we're not spending our tax money on this because I've asked a few people about this and um, a lot of them do say, look, it, it would be a sense of normalcy if we had this, it would be great. You know, our kids could watch it. Our kids are out of school. They're not seeing their friends or depressed. I mean, my kids are, you know, finally broke down recently because, you know, life is so different now. Um, but some people did also say, look, you guys, they, they know some of our part-time employees aren't getting as many hours and, you know, cities are cutting staff and, and serious things are happening. And so we don't want to give them the impression that we're spending tens of thousands of dollars on a really short show uh, when, when there's all this stuff going on right now. So I just think if we can get the message out right, it, it'll look like, you know, the city staff, as they have done, uh, have done a great job getting uh, contributions and getting others to pay for this, and and we get a great show. It's a shame we can't go on the base because it is it, it is wonderful there. But um, I think this would be great if we could get some fireworks. And messaging is key, but I agree. I think we can get the word out, and just psychologically, I think it's it, it would be wonderful. Ron, could you go over the numbers one more time real quick? How much is Seal Beach in for? So, uh, 
sorry, Ron. <laughs> uh, so in my preliminary conversation with the uh, city manager there was between uh, five and 8,000. So if, if that's the case, that more than covers uh, the expense. Uh, what we would, and then to, to Mark and Shelley's point, if it is the desire of the council to move forward, we would probably do a heavy marketing campaign. Uh, we might talk about actually doing a little mailer, those kind of things, just to let everybody know. And obviously we would message those along the way of, this is at no cost to the taxpayer. This is being funded through you know donations and uh, revenue generated from other events and those kind of things. So of course, I, I think that, like you said, uh, Councilmember House America, it's definitely an important part of the messaging. And I think it's not only no cost to the taxpayer, but no cost to the city. I think that's the message we really need. So if we start talking about budget cuts and you know stuff on the ballot to to make us whole, that you know it's not the taxpayers' cost. It's why is the city spending the money when they're claiming they're poor type thing. So that messaging is key. But I think we can do it. I mean, I really do, and let the neighborhoods have some fun. And we give props to our uh, sponsors at the same time, you know, and encourage uh, more sponsorships in the future with uh, some additional advertising for them. Uh, how how much how much is a race on the base kicking in? It's approximately fourteen thousand. And we don't know if, if we can delay that. If if we can't delay it, we lose it. Correct. The fifteen thousand from Republic. Is, can we move that somewhere else? It's their um, community. Um, you know, part of their community um, sponsorship. Right. And, um, honestly, I I'll be honest with you. I have to read their hundred twenty two page contract to see if we can move it somewhere else because uh, mm -hmm. the last several several years. That fifteen thousand has always gone to the Fourth of July, and then if we are allowed to move it somewhere else, then we'd have to have that conversation with Republic Services because they like the fact that our our fireworks show brings in not only you know residents of Los Alamitos but you know people from Seal Beach and Rockmore, and so they like to get their messaging across to all those um, constituents of, of of their services. Okay, thank you. I've got some questions. Is now a good time? Yeah, go ahead, Dean. Okay. Um, Ron said that he'd talked to all the cities and everybody's canceled. Has Cypress canceled their show? That is correct. They have. So, in reality, Cypress pulled away from ours last year to do their own at the college. They've canceled theirs they could potentially be approached to provide some funds towards this one as well. Um, Rossmore used to pay 6000 toward it. Is Rossmore paying anything? At this time, they have not confirmed any uh, monetary donation to the event. Have we approached them? I just had a slight conversation with their general manager and uh, you know, he didn't say yes or no. He didn't. He didn't really tell any, tell me anything. He just said he's going to have a conversation with his board. Okay. City of LA, have they canceled their show at the Coliseum? Yes. I. Yeah, that's a. I don't. I don't. Where they did because of the gathering, and they can't. They can't bring people. Uh, how about the Rose Bowl? Have they canceled theirs as well? I would assume yes. I don't. I don't have that answer for you. But I would assume okay. yes. Well, I'm. You know, you guys said that you talked to all the cities. Those are the two other big shows. Uh, I had a discussion earlier with the city manager, and one of the problems that shooting off the fireworks on the base and all being aerial that we're going to encounter, which will be some additional expenses. Uh, are people in the neighborhoods uh, parking beyond what we normally have because there's no parking on the base? Um, people going to um, the park down in, in the Highlands at Orville Lewis to watch, people going over to um, 
Cottonwood, or not Cottonwood, the the golf course down there, uh, the golf course at the at the Navy golf course. Um, we also have them going to um, property on at Cottonwood Church. We have them going to property all along Catella, any place that they can find. And in some of that industrial area, there are spaces there where they can pull in and load parking lots right up to the fence and be able to watch them as well. I know there was a discussion of whether or not we had liability for people that were going on to private property. And I think I, I'm in favor of, of what the discussion is. I just want to be fully transparent from the standpoint of where some costs should be. Um, it, it, this is the first time that I heard comment that our negotiations with JFTB are such that if they do not, uh, if we do not use the money, the excess money uh, on the 4th of July show, uh, that it has to go up to the state military department. Uh, to me, that that's just wrong. Um, because JFTB also kicked in, if I'm not mistaken, um, under Colonel Bond, and I believe the same under uh, Colonel Dusich. They kicked in five grand. Um, we're going to have an influx of people, even with Cyprus, they were doing theirs on the 3rd of July. That was their plan again this year. That still means that the people of Cyprus can double bang because we don't control who goes on the base for the shows. We won't be able to control traffic wise on who parks illegally, who fills up neighborhoods. Uh, particularly in Carrier Row um, and even in the apartment areas along Parkour, uh, the baseball field. We're going to have an influx of people that normally would go on to the base that aren't going on to the base that are going to want to see the fireworks. We have to take that into some type of, of uh, accounting because the increased calls from residents trying to do the right thing by shooting them off, upsetting the residents further because we're allowing an incursion into their residential areas. Can we charge for parking? What if we set up, specific, Michael, get me if you need to, but what if we had designated places? Uh, council member, you were talking about like the church over there. That's a lot of parking the industrial spaces or the commercial spaces, that's a lot of parking. What if we set up a, a pay for parking if you park in one of those spots? Could we do something like that? Usually private property, they do that up in LA around the Coliseum. They do it up in Pasadena and around the Rose Bowl. People sell their front yards for uh, 15, 20 bucks a space to park their cars on their front yards. Um, I don't think legally, and, and Michael could ad address that part, I don't think legally the city can do any of it, but I think we somehow need to notify all of these property owners um, of the fact that we're going to, to go down this road, this path, and, uh, and, it, and it has the potential of, of creating some additional issues on their property. They may want to hire private security and chain off their driveway and chain off that access. Um, I don't know. Uh, no, well, they, my they thought get... was if we afford parking, then they can utilize the park, whether we charge them for it or not. But if we say, okay, you can park at the, the, um, the baseball field there, or you can park, stay in your car at Cottonwood, but you can park at Cottonwood, or you can park down the long street of Farquhar on the right heading towards the base, which I don't know if normally you can park there. I don't think you can, but designate some parking spots so that it would kind of cut down a little bit on the neighborhood infringement, not completely, 
but just if we could direct the traffic, that might. You're, you're going to have Cypress that's going to be impacted over by the racetrack and along their part of Catella. Um, technically, Cottonwood is in Cypress. You're going to have Seal Beach that's going to be uh, impacted because they normally have them on the beach anyhow, but you're going to have impacts in the Target Center. You're going to have impacts over at the Rossmore Center uh, because if it's an aerial show, that works out even better for people to be able to, to view it from a distance. I like your idea of live streaming it and somehow getting it on the screens and restaurants or, or those facilities that can accommodate, uh, hoping that we've got them back open by that time. And to get, to get on the parking for like Carrier Row, because I'm three houses down from the base, there's not going to be that much available parking because residents park there. A lot of them have barbecues and everything just because of the relationship to the base. As far as LAYB, um, that's a locked gate. It's currently locked um, to keep people off of that. And to make that available for parking because it's base property, I don't even think they would be willing to broach that with the base. You know, we lease that from them. So it's kind of we'd rather just leave it, you know, because then they have to talk about the social distancing and how they're going to park and the bathrooms and, and everything else. So it's, um, I didn't realize it was part of the base. But yeah, it's part, of, part of the base. We have a, a dollar lease with them, but it is part of the base. Um, as far as, you know, Cottonwood and Target Center and everything, it's just basically letting them know that there's going to be a fireworks show, um, you know, and, and regulate it as normal. We're not going to be able to get any money from Rossmore or Cypress because from their cities, they're really not going to be able to see anything. Rossmore, it's going to be very hard on Martha Ann to be able to see anything. So I don't see their compelling reason of donating to the cause if there's no viewing area from Rossmore. Um, but like I say, I think it's important for our local residents to be able to do this. And if it's cost neutral, um, I love the idea. And my neighborhood would be impacted. And I can guarantee if you talk to most people in Carrier Row, they're willing. <clears throat> we do it every year with Race on the Base on the 4th of July already. And for, for the proximity and to be able to view them, they're willing to deal with the hassle. And Dean, the Coliseum and Roseville have canceled theirs. I just looked online while you were talking. Thank you. That, that makes it harder because then they're going to come to us. <laughs> from Pasadena? Pasadena draws from everywhere. But, you know, if, if this is the only place that's doing live fireworks, uh, boy. Remember, a lot of cities have safe and sane that they can do in their front yards. Right. And I think you're going to see some of that, too. You know, that was the original agreement that if they would eliminate allowing safe and sane in the city, we would put on the show. Right. Um, that was the trade out. And if they, if they can't get on the base to do it, or we're not going to do them by shooting them up at the base, I wouldn't be surprised because fireworks are sold in Garden Grove, Westminster, Hawaiian Gardens, uh, Cerritos. Um, people go and buy them there, but I think we're going to have block parties throughout the community the same way, just because people want to get together. More so than we've had in the past, sadly. That means a bigger issue from the standpoint of police. Uh, I still think if we can stream it to all of our little restaurants that are going to need a vitamin everything shot by the time it's a roll around. It could be a win for everybody, as long as they have a television. Well, most of them do. But yeah, that's that's definitely a great bonus. Well, so I'll just for, to kind of hopefully wrap this up, because I've been long-winded about it as well. You know, I'll, I'll move the item that we proceed with the, the fireworks, you know, the 26, 26,000. 32,000 um, with the currently committed money that we have with messaging, staff already knows what to do with that. And 
welcome back LaSalle. We're, we're hopefully opening and let's be patriotic, whether we're physically on the base or not, but at least we're offering something. Is, okay. the, chief, is the chief on the call? Yeah. Can, can chief, could you address, before we vote, could you address uh, the parking in your mind? Where would people park? Well, if we normally get 11, 12 to 15,000 people that show up to this event um, when they're on the base, um, th and that's that's with all of the other events going on, and now that all the events are going to be canceled and we advertise that this event is going to be going on, I have a feeling we're going to have at least that many people in the neighborhoods parking um, somewhere, and that's they'll park wherever they can park a car. And in the shopping centers are park. Um, and I don't know where we're going to be at in terms of, you know, um, opening up for, um, like we were talking about the restaurants, but I'm not even sure with all the social distancing stuff that's still, if that's going to be in a, a situation that's in place at that time that we're going to, um, they're not going to have capacity or near capacity as a result of that. So I think that. I mean, I think this is a great, uh, would, I think the um, Council Member Hasselbrink was saying it's great, I think, for the morale of our citizens and all that. But I think that, um, you know, I don't know, I, I just think that there's going to be a large, a large draw that's going to wind up being probably in all the surrounding neighborhoods that are closest to the event. So all of those neighborhoods are going to be impacted as well as the ones that are i guess that's garden grove or maybe cypress that's you know by the um on the other side of the uh, golf course and uh in that area too where they can see what some of those people actually do watch it from their homes they probably have people in their neighborhoods watching it you know from their outside of their cars in the street wherever they're going to go thank you michelle you made a motion to approve this yes was there a second? Me. Tanya, okay. A roll call vote, please. Mayor Murphy? No. Mayor Pro Tem Churko? Yes. Council Member Doby? Yes. Council Member Gross? Yes. Council Member Hasselbrink? Yes. It passes four to one. Richard, you can still come to my house. I'm not going to be in the city that day because I think we're creating a mess that we're going to regret for years, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> we get 5,000 new people in, where are we going to put them? If all the other cars are parked where they normally are having parties on the streets, I, I think we're making a huge mistake. But Well, the other option is we open up two firework stands and we offer safe and sane for this year for residents to do their own little fireworks in the street. Yeah, I think we're a little late for that, though. Mary, if I may, uh, just real quick, the, the action taken tonight was to make a recommendation to staff that was indicative of the majority of the city council's desire to move forward with the firework display. So the actual agreement with the firework vendor will, in fact, come back to the council for consideration and formal approval. Um, so you all have you will all have a second opportunity to discuss uh, your respective positions on this when that agreement comes back. So it's not fi it's not finalized until June. Excuse me. So is that is it the case that it would not be finalized until June? Chet, Chet may be able to speak more directly to proposed schedules for that, but yes, as as of now, we do not have a final approved agreement with the vendor. We've we've discussed that. It's something I'm confident we will be able to bring forward. It just was not agendized tonight for approval. It was positioned as an opportunity to discuss whether or not you wanted staff to continue down that path. Thank you. So, and to that, Michael, thank you for bringing that up. So two, two things. First being that um, Obviously, we will work, uh, given the fact that it's the desire of the majority of the council to move forward with this item, we will bring it back uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I know I don't want to force any additional meetings on you, um, but that being said, 
Um, there will be some time it was of the essence on this uh, in order to make sure that we get an agreement in place in order to allow for the planning. Uh, so I'll be working with Ron on that. And then number two, uh, given the fact that there is interest in moving forward, I think it's incumbent upon myself, the chief, and uh, city staff to start looking at what are the things that we can do to mitigate the potential issues that might arise out of this. And I'm not saying that we'll be able to mitigate all of them, but I'm saying that reaching out to Cottonwood, looking at what exactly we can do with regards to parking, what our enforcement looks like on the day of the event, all of those things we need to bring back to you now that we know that there's an interest and so that you have a, the opportunity to have all that information when you make your decision. Hey, Chet, and since it sounds like the firework vendor um, is gonna have a plethora of extra fireworks, um, can you strike a deal with them since we seem to be the only game in town? Yeah, it's a- uh, uh, They're getting more of the big shows. I think that is a fair conversation to be having. Why not? A good idea. Can I clarify? Um, you wanted to see if the vendor has additional fireworks to um, shoot off that day. Is that a, is that what you want me to look into? Well, for this for the same price, I mean, obviously supply and demand, and their demand is low, and I'm sure they have a supply of thousands of fireworks. You know, they they don't order these in April, so I'm sure you know their warehouses are full of fireworks that they'd love to get rid of. So maybe they'll strike us a deal. Play play hardball. Tell them you know. <laughs> Tell them there's a lot of uh, a lot of availability out there with other vendors, and we want an hour of fireworks instead of 22 minutes. Yeah, just the bigger shells, you know, instead of the three to four inch. Obviously, we can't do those, but the 10 inch ones. Let's see. I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask. What they can do is say no. That they don't have expiration dates, and they'll be back in 2021. But why not ask? I will send our master negotiating team in to uh... <laughs> an hour, Ron. An hour. <laughs> <laughs> I so we're we're clear on eleven eleven. Yes, sir. Okay. Eleven B preliminary general fund budget for fiscal year twenty twenty one. Thank you, sir. And uh, largely, Craig will be doing the heavy lifting on this one. But uh, this is the preliminary general fund budget. The goal for tonight is obviously to get a real good in-depth understanding of what exactly has happened to the city with regards to uh, sales tax, TOT, um, our other revenues, and of course our expenses for the year going forward. Uh, we knew coming into this year that there was going to be a projected deficit. Uh, we did a lot of work to mitigate that uh, this current year. Um, obviously there's been some additional impacts given the fact that COVID-19 has uh, decimated a lot of our local economy. Um, while we are looking forward to getting our business back open, we realize that there is going to be an impact at least through the fall with uh, how exactly um, it's going to impact our revenues. Um, so again, tonight is to get an idea of what exactly those, um, those impacts look like. And then also to lay out a very general 30,000 foot view strategy with regards to what uh, staff and the standing budget committee have looked at in order to um, be able to uh, close that gap and then also to then um, proceed to a discussion about what exactly the details are um, with regards to things that will be related to uh, our labor unions, which again we'll discuss during closed session. So with that, uh, Craig. Thank you, uh, Chet. Um, Madam City Clerk, I'm not able to share my screen for some reason. One moment, let me double check. Uh, is it? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, good evening again, uh, Mayor and Council. For the record, Craig Kohler, Interim Finance Director. Um, I think the PowerPoint slide was sent to you previously or, or earlier today, so you should have that as well. Um, so the overview tonight, uh, I'll be reviewing and discussing the preliminary budget for the general fund uh, fiscal year 2021. Uh, as Chet had mentioned, city managers mentioned, the staff has been meeting with the budget standing committee uh, on a regular basis. 
Uh, this will be present, presenting this information for the full council uh, for the first time tonight. So as you know, the fiscal sustainability planning projected significant uh, deficit beginning in fiscal year 2021. Um, the, however, the updated modeling projects general fund deficit of approximately 1.3 million for the fiscal year 2021. And this is uh, due to ma several major things. Uh, first thing is significant decrease in revenues as a result of the pandemic. Uh, there's also been some federal and state regulatory changes that has uh, affected this as well. Uh, there's been some uh, measures to uh, offset some of the losses through some budgetary actions that have already taken place. Moving on to slide four. Uh, here's a snapshot of the fiscal year 2021 general fund preliminary budget. You can see we start with the beginning fund balance of 8.8 .8 million, uh, adding in projected revenues and transfers of approximately 13.6 million. Uh, less operating expenditures and transfers out of approximately 14.9 million, uh, ending fund balance of seven, approximately 7.5 million, or a negative change in fund balance or a deficit of $1,347,073. On slide five, this is a snapshot of the preliminary general fund budget revenues for fiscal year 2021 uh, by categories. You can see the overall decrease from the amended budget from 1920 to the preliminary budget for 2021 projects a approximately $790,000 decrease. The major uh, decreases here are, you can see it's sales and use taxes, a decrease of approximately 725,000. Uh, there's small decreases or increases in some other categories. I can go into the detail and explanation in those uh, in the next further slides. On slide six, um, it's, is it overview? Decrease in revenues again, approximately $790,000 uh, less. It's approximately 5% decrease from the previous uh, amended budget. Largest reductions are obviously in sales and use taxes, approximately 725,000. This is assuming HDL's worst case scenario. They presented this information, I believe it was uh, April 16th in our last uh, Zoom or meeting or call with them. Uh, general categories, autos and transportation, approximately down approximately 12%. Business down approximately 9%. Restaurants and hotels decrease of approximately 10%. Uh, some other revenue changes, uh, TOT will see approximately a $60,000 increase. Uh, assuming this is for the third hotel coming online, uh, projecting sometime late in 2020. However, reduced levels of activity for all three hotels at least through the end of 2020 and probably into 2021. Uh, license to permits will be see an increase of projection of about $72,000 increase. Uh, this assumes increased activity once health mandates have been lifted. Uh, property taxes, small decrease of about 46,000. Uh, this is not really related to COVID-19, however, it's more uh, industry driven by the uh, overall decline in sales activities that uh, we're seeing trending now currently in the last fourth quarter. And charge for services, approximately uh, $50,000 less. And this is projection uh, due to reduction in program activity, uh, mainly from uh, rec classes. Looking at slide seven, this is a overview of the expenditures uh, by category requirements for fiscal year 2021. The overall increase uh, from the amended budget is 557,000. Um, biggest increases is in police, and I can go into the detail in the next uh, slide. Recreation community services will be a decrease of approximately 60,000. Uh, finance, a small decrease of 37,000. Uh, overall, again, five, about a $557,000 increase from the prior year amended budget. Further explanation of this is on slide eight. Um, again, the $557,000 increase is approximately 4% over prior year amended budget. Uh, police will be a projection of about 619,000 higher. This is mainly due to uh, MO uh, related um, increases, benefit increases, including purse cost. Uh, breakdown of this, approximately $430,000 in salaries and benefits. Uh, approximately $79,000 for material supplies and services. 
projecting a hundred ten thousand dollars increase in overtime this is in the patrol division and, and this also includes important to note uh, vacant positions um, which we'll discuss further um, in, that, in that area and then recreation community services will be approximately sixty thousand dollar lower uh, this is mainly due to reductions in the cost for the special events for race on the base and uh, for the fourth of july event that are being projected and also important to note there's no general fund expenditures planned for the cip moving on to slide nine there's been some regulatory responses and impacts from this already we've seen uh as for the state level the governor's uh, uh executive order put in place uh allowing business to to delay their payment of the first quarter sales tax liability. Uh, that was affecting the actual fiscal year 1920. There'll be a potential uh, windfall to fiscal year 2021 for all those businesses if they elect to enter into the installment plan with the state. Uh, that 275,000 that would have been lost in 1920 will be received in fiscal year 2021. It'll be spread over 12 months beginning in uh, August of 2020. Uh, also, federal aid, there's been some, obviously, the initial rounds of the stimulus aid has seen no allocation to populations to small cities. It's only these populations that are greater than 500,000. Uh, we're anticipating additional bills that will allow access for the city. Uh, we have not seen anything yet. And then take advantage of other funding programs as they become available. So on slide 10, the assumptions used are many. Uh, this obviously would remind you, this includes the most updated data from HDL, Beacon Economics, uh, based on their worst case scenario, uh, and includes uh, other assumptions that were built into this as well. Uh, moving forward, slide 11, uh, the next, next step is to incorporate further updates as we receive them and as they are available. Uh, the modeling will be to reflect these changes as we go forward. And we want to then uh, discuss uh, preliminary budget actions. Unless there's any questions, I will turn it over to the city manager. So, Mr. Mayor, if I, if I can at this point, uh, I'd like to, to stop and I'll just pause and uh, open to any questions that anyone might have about the numbers and how they were arrived at. I know that there's obviously a number of assumptions that go into that uh just want to point out again that we are trying to be as conservative as we can be uh taking into case the worst case scenario and and building our projections and our models off of that um uh you asked the question at uh, a previous meeting of, of craig uh if he had ever seen anything with this much fluidity and i will tell you that i, I know i haven't uh i know craig answered that question that he hadn't Wow. Uh, truly are in unprecedented times with regards to what is going on and i also want to say that this budget probably more than any in the in past years is going to be very fluid moving forward too um, there is discussion at the state and at the county level about releasing funding uh out of the current cares act there is uh currently legislation that's being negotiated at the federal level uh, with the next round of uh, CARES Act funding, which uh, nobody knows whether or not that ultimately will make it to a vote uh, in the Senate or if it's dead on arrival or if it will uh, be signed by the president. So there's obviously a number of different pieces that are going to fall into place. Um, we also are going to have to take into account any potential changes that come from the state budget um, and any local impacts that it might have as well. So. Um, this is all by way of saying that I anticipate that while we will get to an adopted budget uh, before July, um, that it's going to be fluid and we're going to have to revisit it almost constantly to ensure that uh, we're taking into account all the relevant data and that our projections uh, continue to line up because uh, obviously there's a, there's a chance that we will have to make uh, mid-course uh, corrections. Thank you. So if there's no question just about uh, how we arrived at the at the current numbers, I, I'd like to just go and take a few minutes to talk about 
kind of the methodology that we've uh, been approaching the budget deficit with and, and how exactly uh, the different, I guess, ideas that we've been applying to it are. Uh, with that, Craig, would you mind advancing the slide? So obviously a uh, 1.347 uh, uh, hole is, uh, is not a small hole, but I believe that uh, through some hard work and some uh, tough choices that we can find ourselves uh, at a balanced budget. Next slide, please. Uh, to basically to go about this, the Budget Standing Committee and staff kind of approached it through four basic tenets. First was reviewing the city's operation in order to determine potential opportunities for cost savings or revenue generation. Uh, the next was assessing our current uh, personnel allocations and seeing where there might be uh, some cost savings with regards to reorganizing our current operations. Uh, then from there, we moved into uh, looking at various positions that we may be able to strategically hold open in order to uh, achieve some cost savings there. And then the last was to uh, look and see where it was appropriate, um, where we could actually achieve meaningful savings through budget austerity measures. Um, and that includes anything from uh, additional cuts to O&M, but also discussions with our labor regards to how um, we currently fund our, our operations. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to take all of these kind of one at a time. I'd like to take each one of these one at a time and I'll be speaking in generalities about each one of these items uh, simply because there is a conversation that uh, the city council will need to have in closed session uh, before getting into the, the details of that. So the first was reviewing potential opportunities for cost savings. Uh, staff did go through and look through uh, the really significant work that had already been done with regards to the fiscal sustainability plan, uh, testing all those hypotheses, um, trying to see where exactly um, there might be opportunities to, um, to get a few more dollars here and there. Uh, we have been able to implement a number of those, such as uh, reducing O&M, looking for opportunities for contracting and uh, deferring uh, large scale projects in order to maintain our cash flow. Um, as I said, we have implemented some of these in 2019, 2020 budget, which allowed us to bring that budget in, uh, if not completely balanced, uh, very close. Um, there are a number of items in there though that uh, obviously can't be implemented uh, just by the stroke of a pen. Some of them require uh, meet and confer with the various labor groups. Uh, the negotiations with surrounding cities and other agencies and then ultimately potentially uh, voter approval uh, but we are looking and have looked at each and every one of them uh, next slide please uh, this is where we really get into the meat and potatoes of the overall organization um, one of the places where uh, i do see some value and i do see some uh, cost saving potential is from a restructuring of the development services and the recreation department uh, essentially, what I would propose is um, moving uh, the acting deputy director into development services in order to lead that group, and then having uh, the recreation manager uh, advanced into the uh, acting director position there in order to lead that department. Uh, it's a, from just a operational standpoint, uh, it gives me a little bit more, um, I guess, coverage in terms of uh, where I have key people. And then also um, the goal of this is also to achieve uh, salary savings and it allows me to achieve a significant amount of savings while having proper management in place and while still um, allowing us to show a significant uh, budget reduction. And that move alone uh, saves us uh, in the neighborhood of 200,000. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next was looking at our um, our work plan, the, the items that we'll be doing here in the next year, and really taking a look at the open positions that we have and trying to make sure that we gained a structure that would allow us to be successful in delivering services, but also would allow us to take advantage of some of the salary savings that could be achieved by holding certain positions open. Um, I know that there's typically a, a desire to just to go, okay, we're gonna freeze every position. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that this city has done a great job in the past in 
holding certain positions open, only feeling when absolutely necessary. And given that there's very little room left to um, to make those kind of broad sweeping um, uh, edicts without really impacting the overall services. And so what we have done as staff along with the budget standing committee is go through and take a look at the various positions that we have open and strategically chosen the ones that we think that we can hold open that will have the smallest amount of impact on our overall operations and allow us to continue to deliver the services that our residents have uh, come to expect. Um, obviously, uh, what I'm trying to achieve as well is a certain amount of flexibility so that we're able to address new needs because there will be new needs uh, as we start to uh, embrace the new normal. And so we want to make sure that we're not putting people into positions that we either no longer need or a function that we no longer need. Um, this obviously is uh, far reaching, would touch every department. There's no one that would uh, you know, be unscathed in this. And so each of the operational departments are obviously giving up a lot in order to uh, make these changes. And uh, I think that's an important kind of point to, to land on as well is that while I find the, the, pro the proposal that I will make to the city council uh, to be workable for the 2021 year, um, it, I liken it to running a car in the, in the yellow or in the red. Um, you do it for too long and it just falls apart. So this is something that I think can be sustained for the short term, but uh, obviously will need to be revisited um, as we go throughout the year. Um, and I will say, again, freezing these positions and reassigning some of the work allows us to achieve a fairly significant savings uh, right around the uh, million dollar mark. Uh, next slide, please. And then the next is to take a look at some of the different um, austerity measures that we can put into place to close that final gap. Um, largely, this revolves around um, the furloughed employees that we already have within public works, which is you know around 80% or so of those hours, which have been reduced. Um, other salary savings by staggering the hiring of uh, different positions throughout the year so that we're able to accomplish a little bit of cost savings. And then lastly, the uh, probably most significant and probably most impactful to our employees, again, is a discussion with uh, the various unions about ways that we deliver service and uh, the potential cost savings that we can uh, can achieve through that. Um, next slide, please. And so with that, that uh, pretty much ends our, uh, our budget presentation in this form. Um, obviously, we wanted to make sure that we gave you a, a broad picture of the, uh, the hurdle that we need to get over and the, the things that we are thinking about um, in order to, to get over that. Uh, I will say that from a just from a strategic standpoint, uh, I see this this budget as being a bunch of uh, tactical decisions that we're going to need to make while we go into next year and start to address the new normal and then start to make strategic decisions about where exactly we want to end up at the end of uh, 2021. Uh, with that, uh, obviously uh, open to any questions. No questions yet. Okay. City Attorney, do you want to bring us into closed session? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. The City Council will now adjourn to closed session to discuss items 12A through C as listed on tonight's agenda.